Okay, we're live, Laura. Hey, how are you? Good, it's nice to be back. And now we're back, but at the Yellow Farmhouse, a new venue. Yes, we took a, a week or so off and um, we're back in our farmhouse kitchen, where I am today. Um, Jen is joining me at the farmhouse, she's in our library. And we're really excited to be cooking with folks this morning and to get back to a little bit more of our regular routine, um, yep. which will be uh, a little bit more farm driven. It's the way we typically cook in these classes is kind of based on what's coming off the Stoneacres farm. Um, this spring we were more limited and people were really, you know, staying home and kind of cooking out of their pantries. So we did a little bit more of pantry cooking than we normally do. Um, so we're excited to be back and working with more fresh produce, fresh, fresh crops, rather. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, and to have some access to some of the wonderful books that we have here, and of course, to be able to bring people out onto the farm, which is exciting. Yeah, so um, as people are joining, um, please go ahead and type your name into the chat so we know who's there. Um, if you don't know, my name is Laura, and I'm here with Jen. And um, I'm going to be leading us through a recipe this morning for strawberry shortcake, um, which is delicious. I'm, you know, you're hard pressed to find somebody who doesn't like strawberry shortcake. And this is the time of year to make it um, because the strawberries are just at the tail end of their season, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so I'm giving folks a, a chance to get in and get settled. And then I'll go over the supplies and the ingredients that we need. Yeah, and I think I will be um, taking myself out of the feed for a little bit so that you can do the demo and then I'll join you back up again when we want to go look at some strawberries out in the garden. Right, so that's the other nice thing about being back here at the farmhouse is now we can easily pop out and show you what's happening on the farm. So Jen's going to do that a little bit this morning with um, some of the strawberry plants that we have. Stone Acres doesn't grow enough strawberries to sell in the farm stand, but we do have some growing in the formal garden. Yeah. Um, it'll be fun. And you know, these classes, what I'm excited about them for the summer, we've always talked about the intergenerational approach to cooking. Um, and so these classes are geared towards children as young as three. Um, but this recipe is really lovely. And as all the recipes will be in our, our um, you know, accessible for any age. So, you know, please let your friends know. And, um, you know, especially on cloudy days, join us on these um, Tuesday mornings where we'll, we'll do a different recipe each week. Yes, we can always, um, we would love to have more friends visiting on um, these yeah. classes and new faces and old faces. Yeah. Um, so again, if you're just joining, um, go ahead and put your name in the chat and we're going to get started. I'll begin by just going over the ingredients and, um, and what you'll need. Hi, Ava. So glad you're joining us. Um, Ava is four and my son is four and I made this recipe with him and he really enjoyed it. So I think that you'll like it, Ava. So, okay, I'm going to say goodbye. I'm going to just kind of put myself backstage and I'll respond to comments and um, I'm going to make it so that you can still hear me. Okay, great. Okay. So, um, so as I said, we're making strawberry shortcake, which means we're actually making sort of three different components of this recipe. So the first thing that we're going to make is biscuits. Then we're going to make sort of like a strawberry sauce that's going to go on top of the biscuit. And then third, we're going to make whipped cream. So um, the first thing, oh, I'm sorry. First, let me go over the, the ingredients that we'll need. So you'll need um, two and a quarter cups of flour, and that is for the biscuit. We're also going to have two tablespoons of baking powder. And Jen's put this up at the bottom, so you don't have to worry. It's going to keep repeating. We will need half a teaspoon of baking soda. And both of those ingredients help the biscuits kind of rise and get fluffy. And then also some salt for the biscuits, um, a teaspoon of salt. And then buttermilk. Um, these are buttermilk biscuits and the buttermilk gives it kind of a nice flavor. But if you don't have buttermilk at home, you can make some essentially with um, milk and white vinegar or lemon juice. So if you're not using buttermilk, you can make that now um, and let it sit for a few minutes before we use it. So it would be one cup of milk and one tablespoon of vinegar or lemon juice. And if you just stir those together and then set it aside, um, you can use that in place of the buttermilk. Okay. And then of course, we're going to need strawberries. Um, we put um, an amount because, you know, you can kind of put a little tablespoon of strawberry sauce on top of your shortcake 
or a lot. Um, so I just bought a pint of strawberries, but um, you know you want to have like at least a, two cups, I would say, and then some sugar. Um, I'm using just white table sugar or granulated sugar. And for the whipped cream, oh, I'm sorry, one other thing that's very important. I have it in the fridge because you want it to stay cold. We need butter for the biscuits. Um, one and a half sticks of butter, which I'll grab in just a moment. Um, and for the whipped cream, we're going to be using heavy cream, a little bit of vanilla extract, which gives it a nice flavor, and then um, some more of that white sugar. All right, so it looks like a few more people have joined. This is great. I see Frankie and Liz, oh, and who else? Oh, and Dawn is with Ava. Okay, great. So let me grab the butter and I'll give you a chance to get yourselves um, ready. And then we're gonna start prepping our biscuits in just a moment. Okay. I was just going to say, um, just as a note, if anybody has any, joining in for a second, if anybody has any questions along the way about an ingredient, just put it right into the comment and we'll be able to answer it because I'm monitoring all the comments from backstage. Thank you. Yes, because at some point here, my hands are going to be dirty and I won't want to have them on the keyboard. So Jen's going to help with that. So, okay, before we jump into the biscuits, I have a question for those of you who have joined. And I think this is the question you're going to know the answer to. Let's see if everybody's brains are working this morning. What season is it right now? So if you know the answer, type it into the chat. What season is it? And I'll give you a little hint. It's a little warm here in the farmhouse. And the name of this season starts with the letter S. Let's see who can answer first. What season is it? Hmm. Because we talk a lot about seasons here on the farm because different foods grow in different seasons. When the weather is really warm, certain plants and vegetables really like that warm, hot weather. When it's cold, other plants and vegetables like it. Oh, Ava got it first. Yes, it is summer. Well done. So that means that we're actually in the season of the year when we have the most coming off of the farm and we have all of these great fruits and vegetables to cook with and, and to enjoy. And so Strawberries are one fruit that grows here in Connecticut at this time of the year, in the beginning of the summer, actually. The month of June is the best time for strawberries around here. Um, so we thought that we would cook with them today to really enjoy them before they are out of season. Um, I'm curious also to know if everyone could just type into the chat um, when their birthday is. So the month of the year when your birthday is, um, because we have this cool tool that we use sometimes in our classes here called a seasonality wheel. And it tells you what is in season in this part of the world, or in this part of the country rather, um, at different times of the year, in different seasons. So if I turn the wheel, let's see if I can do this backwards. If I turn the wheel to June, right? It gives me this little window and I'll hold it up closely. Hopefully you can see part of it. Oh, I'm sorry, there we go, June. It shows you what fruits and vegetables are in season in June. And strawberries are right here. And then these foods are things that you can find all year round. So for example, um, let's see, eggs. Um, so chickens will lay eggs all year round oftentimes. So you can get those in any season. But strawberries, if you're um, looking for local strawberries that grow here, you can only get them around this time of the year. So um, Amanda said July, okay, so that's similar. We're gonna have a lot of fruits and vegetables growing in July. So one that I see that is a favorite in my house is blueberries. Those come into season in July. Also, we start to get tomatoes in July. Um, Ava is born in October. So if I turn the wheel for October, I can see, let's say we have some different vegetables to choose from. Broccoli is um, a crop that likes cooler weather. So that comes into season in the fall in October when Ava was born. So um, it's just sort of interesting to think about different seasons mean that we get different foods to eat. And so that's why um, we're cooking with strawberries today. So the first thing that we need to do to get ready um, to make our biscuits is to preheat the oven to 425 degrees. So if you haven't done that yet, go ahead and preheat the oven. And then you're gonna get a mixing bowl because we're going to start to make our dough. 
All right? So for a biscuit, the first ingredient is the flour. I'm using just all-purpose white flour. You could probably substitute in whole wheat flour if you had that. Um, I don't know about a gluten-free flour. You would probably have to make some other adjustments. So I would stick with just an all-purpose of white flour or a whole wheat flour for these biscuits. And we're going to measure two and a quarter cups. All right, so I have a measuring cup. Um, we use this type of cup to measure things that are solid, like this flour. I'm going to measure one cup, put that into my mixing bowl, then go back and measure a second cup. Let's see if I can do this without making a mess. Although, to make a mess, that's not such a big deal either. We can always clean it up, All right? So that's two cups. And I kind of, if you see, I kind of shook it a little bit so that it's flat across the top. You can even get really precise and use a knife, to make it extra flat and precise. All right, that's two cups and then one more quarter cup. So I have a smaller um, measuring cup here. All right, so that flour is going into the mixing bowl and then I'm gonna add in the baking powder, baking soda and salt. So again, it is two teaspoons of baking powder these are easy to get confused. Baking powder is this one. All right, so I'm gonna measure two teaspoons and I have like a smaller measuring spoon here for that. One, two, and then just a little bit of the baking soda, half a teaspoon, okay? And again, these help the biscuits get fluffy. They're called a, a leavener um, and they, they help it sort of rise up and get puffy. All right, so half a teaspoon of baking soda, and then a little bit of salt, which is gonna add some flavor. So it's one teaspoon of salt. So these biscuits actually aren't sweet. We're not adding sugar, um, because the strawberries are gonna have sugar on them, and the strawberries themselves are quite sweet because they're ripe and in season, and then the whipped cream is gonna have sugar in it. So the, the biscuits sort of balanced um, by not having sugar in it. So then I'm going to grab a spoon and we're going to just stir this together so it gets sort of mixed and evenly incorporated. Okay. And then once you've done that, you can set it to the side and we're going to start cutting our butter. Okay. So when you're making biscuits, you want cold butter. So I just took mine out of the refrigerator. Um, that's just going to help the biscuit have the right texture. And that's sort of a, a cooking word for like how it feels when you touch it or when you put it in your mouth. All right. So for this recipe, we need one and a half sticks. It calls for unsalted butter because we added salt to the flour mixture. Um, if you have salted butter only, you can still use it. Your biscuit's just going to be a little bit saltier. Um, so one and a half. So I'm going to start by, let's see if you can see this. There we go. Um, I'm going to use a butter knife and I'm going to cut half of this stick. So that's four tablespoons. Okay, set that other half stick aside. And then you can um, peel off the wrapper and we're going to cut the butter into um, about half inch cubes. So that means like little squares, All right? Because we are, are going to be mixing the butter into the flour mixture. And so when we make it into little pieces, it's gonna make it easier to do that. So you have a choice for this. A butter knife will work just fine. Um, you don't need something really sharp to cut butter. So you can start using a butter knife and just cutting little squares or pats of butter. We also often use a mezzaluna in our classes. We like this tool, um, mezzaluna means half moon because of the shape of this. Um, but it's a good tool to have in the kitchen when you're um, cooking with kids because the kids' hands stay on these wooden handles and that means that they're not gonna be underneath the blade and um, there's no worry about them getting cut. So you could use a mezzaluna if you have one at home that works really well for this too. All right, so I'm gonna cut the butter into these half inch pieces. So let me show you about what we're aiming for here. And then along these lines, okay? So it's almost like a like a dice or um, like a die that you would have in a board game, something like that. So you don't have to worry too much about getting it teeny tiny because once we um, put it into the flour, we're gonna use this tool again 
to make them even smaller. Okay, so I'm just going through, and this is actually like kind of fun um, to cut this up and then I can just add it to the bowl. I'm trying to touch it as little as possible because as I said, you want the butter to stay cold and our hands, especially in the summertime, are pretty warm. So the heat of our hands can melt the butter. So I'm trying to touch it as little as possible. It's not a big deal. None of this is going to mean that your um, biscuits won't taste good. It just means that the, the texture will be a little bit different. Okay, so it can sometimes stick to the blade there. So I'm just gonna pull that off. And then I find it easier to make like make a little tower and then cut them all at once instead of doing it individually. But you can find a method that works for you. All right, so chopping that up into these little pieces and I'm kind of sprinkling it into my bowl. And um, this biscuit recipe is one that once you learn how to do it, you will probably find yourself making them over and over again because they're really good for something sweet like strawberry shortcake, but they're also really good just to have like with maybe eggs and cheese for breakfast. Um, or if you make like soup for dinner, you can make biscuits on the side. So it's a good recipe to learn how to make. Okay, so I'm almost done here. Oh, I can definitely feel the butter getting a little softer because um, it is warm in here in the farmhouse. I don't know, you might be cooking in a kitchen with air conditioning, but our farmhouse does not have air conditioning and that 400 degree oven, 425 degree oven is making it a little warm. Okay, so I'm just about done here. So I've chopped up the butter into these small pieces. It's okay if it's not perfect. Put it into the bowl. Okay, and let me just see if anyone has a question or needs me to stop. Looks like we're you were go oh, good, Laura. No right. question so far. You're cooking, and then you don't necessarily want to touch. Yeah, your no, I'm I'm paying attention here. I got it, checking it in. So, um, you may be just finishing up cutting your butter, but I'm going to show you the next step, which is to so you have your bowl with the flour mixture and the butter, and then you're going to use a mezzaluna if you have one. If you don't, you can also use a pastry knife. Um, if you don't have one of those, you could use the recipe says two knives. So this is a technique I'm not that familiar with, Jen. So maybe you can um, chime in and tell me if I'm doing it properly. But essentially you're like cutting the butter into the flour, right? Yeah, so I was just gonna say, you do sort of like this, like you almost like pull it apart. Okay, so I'm going back and forth with these two knives. And this is pretty fun if you're doing it at home. You'll, I think you'll agree. Um, I'm just trying to cut the butter, what they say, cut it into the flour, right? So I'm taking these little pieces that I just chopped up and making them even smaller. And the reason you're using the knife instead of like your fingers to do that is because you really want the butter to, to stay, um, you don't want it to kind of get melty and mushy. You want it to stay firm, like nice cold butter. And so the knives are gonna be a lot cooler because it's a metal and metals don't connect, you know, they, they stay cooler than our hands, which are really warm. That's right. So and, um, a pastry knife is, can look kind of like what the mezzaluna looks like, but with three of them. Like right. it'll have like three knives across. And so it, it does a really nice job, but a mezzaluna works just fine. It does. And so let me see if I can kind of show this um, as I'm doing it, right? I'm kind of rocking the blade back and forth and I'm just trying to cut those larger pieces of butter into smaller pieces. And the recipe says to keep going until the pieces are about the size of a pea. So that's something most people can probably picture in their head. You have seen peas on your dinner plate before. I hope that you gobbled them up, but if not, then you maybe just spent time staring at those peas like my son does. Um, so you're cutting the butter into the flour until it's pretty even, meaning that all of the pieces of butter are about the same size. All right, so this is pretty fun to do, I think. Okay. And you want to have those bigger pieces of butter in your dough because then they're going to um, give you a nice sort of flaky texture on your biscuit. Trust me, it's going to be delicious. I practiced this recipe yesterday just to make sure that I knew how to do it and um, they were 
delicious. So I'm getting biscuits two days in a row. Let's see, it might happen in your house where if you make them today, you might just want to make more tomorrow. All right, so I have the butter cut into the flour, and the next step is to add the buttermilk. Okay, so um, I'm using buttermilk today, but as I said, you could use um, milk with some vinegar or lemon juice stirred in. So vinegar and lemon juice are both um, what we call like an acid. It's something pretty sour. Like if you stuck your finger in it and touched it to your mouth, it would make your, your mouth pucker. Um, so if you take one cup of milk and add a tablespoon of white vinegar or lemon juice, you can make something similar to buttermilk that will work in this recipe. If you have buttermilk, you're going to go ahead and measure a cup. Now, okay, you're going to see me doing something a little wrong right here. Because usually when we measure something that's liquid, we use a clear measuring glass. But I did not get one out. So I'm going to use this measuring cup. Um, but if you're doing it at home, you would use one of those um, clear measuring cups so that you can kind of see exactly when it gets to one cup. All right, so let me just make sure. One cup of buttermilk. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and measure that. And I can smell it. It's similar to almost like the smell of yogurt. It smells a little bit sour like that, okay? And I'm going to start with just half, drizzle it over, and then start mixing it. Laura, I'm joining back in to tell a little bit about buttermilk because I always um, think it's kind of interesting because in a little bit we're going to be making the whipped cream. And if you take cream and whip it, it, it turns into whipped cream. And if you keep shaking it or whipping it, it will eventually turn into butter. And when you make butter, the solids come together. So you have the yellowy butter. And then there's this liquid that's with it and it separates the solids from the liquids. And that liquid that's left over is actually buttermilk. Um, but if you make butter at home, the buttermilk um, is, it will taste pretty much like very watery milk. But if, um, if you buy it from the store, it, it's the same, it's a uh, buttermilk, but it's been fermented. So it's been allowed to, to develop some um, of that bit sourness, which is why milk with vinegar works really well because it has a little bit of that bite that you're looking for. And what, what's um, really neat about it is at the beginning you put in the um, you put you added um, baking soda and baking powder, and in order for those to work really well, it has to interact with an acid, which is what you mentioned about like the um, the um, vinegar, the lemon. Well, buttermilk is an acidic; it has a sort of like acidy flavor. And for the baking soda and baking powder to work, it has to mix with an acid and get bubbly. And if you wanna try an experiment later, you can mix some vinegar with some baking soda and you'll see those bubbles. Those bubbles are what makes the biscuit really flaky and um, puffy and light. Yeah. And so that's why buttermilk is, is why you wanna use buttermilk instead of milk. Milk would work just fine in the biscuits. They just wouldn't be as fluffy. Right, thank you for adding that. So you're right, it is like a fun side science experiment to play around with. Um, and those two ingredients react um, and work together to make your biscuits taste even better. So I, at this point, I've added the full cup of buttermilk and you can kind of see me working it first with a spoon to stir it in. And then I just got to a point where I gave up on the spoon and just wanted to use my hands because that seemed easier um, to incorporate all the last bits of flour in my bowl into this dough. And I can still see, let's see if I can show the camera. I can still see like pieces of butter in the dough and that's really good. That's what we're looking for to get the texture that we want, all right? So you are going to, once you have mixed it together and you have this nice dough to work with, you're gonna put a little bit of flour on your work surface and that's just gonna keep it from sticking. And I'll sort of spread that out so this is another fun thing to do in the kitchen. Um, and we're just gonna like knead it a little bit to get it incorporated so that it's really even um, throughout. Now the recipe called for a rolling pin, but when I did this at home, I found that I really didn't need one, that it's, it's pretty soft. Um, and so at this point, you're just gonna pat your dough into a disc. So that means like a circle, like a plate, and it's gonna be about a half inch thick, all right? So if you have a rolling pin and you want to use that, you can. Um, but I, I didn't want to make it too flat and then have like pancakes instead of biscuits. So I'm rolling this out. You can see 
into, it's about the size of a dinner plate. And I'm not too stressed about the thickness either. Um, the recipe says half an inch, but I'm not breaking out a ruler. I'm just gonna kinda eyeball it. You know, somebody taught me once your knuckle for a grown up is about an inch. So I just kinda use that to gauge. That looks about a half a knuckle or half an inch. Um, and then to cut the biscuits into the shape that we want, which are smaller rounds, um, you could use a cookie cutter if you have a round cookie cutter, but we are using a mason jar, which is like a glass jar. We have a lot of them here at the farmhouse. Um, and so any size really will work. It just sort of depends how big you want your biscuit to be. Um, and I'm gonna use this as a cookie cutter. So I'm gonna turn it upside down, place it on this disc of dough, and just kind of press down and twist a little bit. And then out pops a little biscuit. And then each one that I make, I'm gonna place onto a cookie sheet. You don't have to grease it because there's so much butter in the biscuit. So um, you can just start repeating that process until you've used up the whole disc. Um, and then you'll see you'll have some scraps left over and we'll just repeat it, kind of roll it out again. So similar to making cookies, um, you usually use the same process. Now you can see sometimes they get a little stuck in the glass. You just kind of give it a shake. All right, these look really good. Okay. And the recipe says it yields 12 biscuits. So of course it depends a little bit on how big your cookie cutter is, what size you're using. But I think I'm gonna be able to get six to put on this first cookie sheet and then I'll repeat it and get six more, all right? So those look really yummy. Who doesn't like a biscuit? Okay, so here's number seven. It feels a little bit like Play-Doh, um, so you'll probably enjoy squishing it in your fingers, but like we were saying before, you wanna try to touch it as little as possible so that you don't melt the butter with your fingers. Okay. So I'm sort of out of dough here. I don't have enough to put the glass down and have it covered. So I'm going to fold this all back together and make another disc, okay? So if you have um, like a marble cutting board at home, sometimes people have those in their kitchen and that's a good thing to use for something like this because like the metal of the knife, marble or stone stays nice and cool. So you could be doing this on your countertop at home as well. Um, that will help keep the butter cold. All right, so now I have the disc again. And I'm gonna punch out a few more biscuits. And I probably have enough to even make one or two more. So I hate to waste anything, especially something as delicious as buttermilk biscuits. So I'm gonna do that one more time. And I think I'll end up with 14 biscuits because the glass that I'm using is a little bit on the smaller side. So you might have slightly fewer, but they'll be bigger. Okay. It's getting a little stickier, so I probably um, use a little bit more flour to keep the cutting board from sticking. All right. There we go, whoop. <laughs> okay, so this one I might actually just like shape with my hands into a little biscuit since I only have a little bit left. And I'll put that on this cookie sheet. I'm gonna put the biscuits in the refrigerator to cool a little bit because that's gonna help that butter firm up just a bit before I put it in the oven. Just gonna make like an even better texture. If you're in a hurry when you're making these, you don't have to, you can skip that step. Um, but we have time, so I'm going to just pop them in the refrigerator, and then we're going to get started on our strawberries. Okay. So I'm rinsing my hands because they're a little bit sticky and gooey from the dough. Okay. And I'm just gonna clean up my work surface here a little bit because we're switching from making the biscuits to making the strawberry topping. And good news is guys, the hardest part is done. It's pretty easy from here on out. Okay. So let's 
So let's see, I'll use this cutting board for my strawberries. And actually, I'm gonna wash this mezzaluna and use that again. I've already washed the strawberries, um, so if you haven't done that at home, go ahead and give them a rinse. And like I said, I have a, a pint of strawberries. Um, you know, you wanna have like at least two cups, I would say, um, to be able to serve with your biscuits. All right. So some of you at home might have fancy um, tools for taking the hull out of the strawberry, but I find a butter knife works just fine. All right, so we aren't gonna use the um, leaves at the top of the strawberry. So you can start by just sort of preparing the strawberries by cutting off the tops. Now you want them to look like this. And then I'm gonna go back and chop them into bite-sized pieces. And in a few minutes, um, Miss Jen went out to the garden. We're gonna um, bring her back in in just a moment to show us what the strawberries look like on the actual plant where they grow. Um, I believe the ones that we have in the garden are on the smaller side. Um, but they're really beautiful and juicy and delicious. So you can um, start this. And then just keep going for as many as you want to have to serve um, with your biscuits. I, I'm probably gonna go ahead and do the whole bowl because um, we have some of our summer interns here today um, at the farm. So I'm sure that they'll be happy to have some leftover strawberry shortcake after lunch. And that's my challenge to you all. But given the timing, it's 11.30, it's getting to be lunchtime. It's gonna be hard to resist this and not eat it before lunch. I don't know, you'll have to see whoever's cooking with you today. If they'll let you sneak a few bites before lunch and then maybe have the rest of it after lunch. All right, so with the strawberries, it's really simple. All we're gonna do um, is cut the leaves off and the top, which can be kind of tough. It has like a bit of like the stem or the hull. Um, and then we're gonna cut them into bite-sized pieces either using the mezzaluna or a butter knife should work. If they're ripe strawberries, they're pretty soft. And then we're gonna sprinkle a little bit of sugar on top and let them sit. Um, and the kind of fancy word of the day for that, um, we're, we're macerating the strawberries, which means to kind of soften them a little bit um, in liquid. So you'll see once you cut them and sprinkle some sugar on top, the strawberries release some of their juice and you end up with something similar to like a syrup. Um, so it's pieces of strawberries with a little bit of juice. So I'm using my mezzaluna to just quarter the strawberries um, and put those into sort of bite-sized pieces. And while I continue that process, I think I'm gonna invite Jen in to show us the strawberry plants out in the garden. So you can keep chopping and let's see. There we go. All right. There we go. Hi, how are you? Hey, I'm good. It's fun to watch you from here. Yeah, I know. I'm glad it worked out. It's not raining. and um, I know, I know. It's surprisingly bright, actually, despite all these clouds. So I will, I guess I'll show you the strawberry plant. So um, I have strawberries right next to me here. This is a different breed of strawberry. So it's different than the strawberries Laura's using. These are called alpine strawberries. And this particular variety makes berries that are pretty small. Let me see if I can find one here. This is about how big they get. Yeah, they're like they're these like tiny baby ones. They almost look they're like really, blackberries. They are, and they're really, really sweet. Um, and what's neat about these is that they kind of grow all through the season. So even after June, you'll still get more strawberries. You just don't get enough to make. Um, you know, they're they're not bred for cooking. You know, for cooking or for these sort of larger strawberries. But if we look at the strawberry plant, so they have these leaves. We can pull some of these off, and you'll notice they they have sort of these ridged uh, leaves that come in three, so that's how you know they're strawberry leaves. Mm. And then um, the flower is looks like this little beautiful white flower here. And the way that flowers um, and fruits work is that in order to actually get a fruit like a strawberry or a blueberry, you actually have to have your flower pollinated. And so it's usually pollinated by a bee or a butterfly or another insect. 
And if the flower gets pollinated, which means that the, the insect will land on here and this top part has some pollen in it. Let's see if I rub it on my on my hand if it if we get any yellow. This pollen, you can get a little bit off. I don't know if I can pull some of that pollen off, but you get these like little yellow bits. Uh, will land on a bee um, back. And when they go to drink the nectar from another flower, that pollen mixes with the pollen from the next flower. And if that happens, the flower is pollinated and it'll turn into a fruit. And what's kind of cool is that, let's see if this works. Let me see. Tell me if you can see, Laura. Let's see. So on the bottom of the flower, and I can pull another one off, let's see. On the bottom of the flower, you can see those green. Can you see the green leaves yeah. there? Yes. So those are called sepals. And that's actually the top of the strawberry that you cut off. Um, at the beginning. So what happens is the, the, if it's pollinated, all those white petals fall off. And then the center part, and you can see a baby strawberry growing here. Let's see, can you see that? Oh, I have to figure out how to get my camera right. You can see the baby strawberry, this, those little petal uh, sepals, those green sepals are on the top. And then the strawberry starting to grow underneath. Let me see if I've got it in the screen. And you can see this one here is starting to grow. And then this one here is growing even bigger. But those, those sepals that were, were helping uh, protect the flower, so they kind of like hold the flower bud. Mm -hmm. um, so when you see a flower bud, it's usually greenish. Um, and then when it starts to open, the sepals open and the petals come out from under it. And the sepals are usually always right underneath mm. that flower still. I'll right. see you as we're walking around if I can see another flower. Um, I have our friend Sadie with us. Will you grab one of the, any of the flowers from over there and just pull one off at the stem and we'll see if we can see the sepals on the other one. So sepals okay. is a science word, a botany word. Perfect. Right. Thank you so much. Yeah. So here's another flower. Just one second. If you look underneath, can you see those sort of like green spiky things there? Yes. Those are the oops, those are the sepals that were protecting the bud before it opened. They're always still right. there. And that's what you see on top of the strawberry. Oh great. Okay. So, so those are those are those are not technically leaves. They're the, they're the part that was protecting the bud and then the bud opened and then the flower gets pollinated and then the fruit grows and the sepals are still underneath it there. Right. Oh, I did want to mention something about that because strawberries are sort of unique. Um, but before we finish up with that, I just want to say that at this point, I'm going to put the biscuits in the oven, okay? So they, okay. they chill and, um, because they take about 15 to 20 minutes to bake. So I'm going to go ahead and put them in the oven. Um, and then I, I want to talk a little bit more about strawberries. Okay, I'm going to show you while you're doing that. I'm going to see if you guys can see any of these. I don't know if you can capture it. But I see some ants in there. Um, and so ants are a pollinator too. We don't often think of ants as pollinators. But um, ants, butterflies, um, and bees all are pollinators. And ants are a really important pollinator. So I see quite a few ants. Oh, here's one. Look, can you see that one on the flower there? Um, Can't tell if I'm on. Well, I can't see it, yet, but that doesn't mean it's not there. It's hard to it's hard to see what I'm showing. Oh, there we go. The one that my fingers are on had an ant on it, but I think oh, I scared okay. him away. Um, but those um, the ants were were crawling all around, so I think these are probably pollinated by ants. Although over here I see another pollinator, and it looks like a little fly of some sort. I don't know if you could see that. Right. I mean, so often we think of bugs in the garden as a pest, but they are really important as well. Some bugs, you know, they'll eat the eat the plants and, and eat the fruit that we want to eat. So we think of them as a pest, but without them, the plants wouldn't be pollinated and we wouldn't get that fruit. Yeah. And so you put the biscuits in the oven. Did you say how long they go in for? Yes. Yeah, so I set a timer for 15 minutes. Um, it's going to depend a little bit on the size. Mine are on the smaller side. So I think they'll be done around 15 minutes. Um, it could go up to 20 minutes, but I would always, you know, check it on the lower end first and see, um, cause if they're browned up and firm after 15 minutes, you're done. Um, okay. And so then another sort of interesting thing about strawberries is, you know, typically you think of a fruit and you bite into it like an apple or an orange and you plant seeds inside. 
Um, and so people often say that strawberries are unique because the seeds are on the outside of the fruit, but there's sort of a, a catch here because the, the berry part that we think of as the fruit, that, that sweet red part of the plant is not actually the fruit, right? So what you're seeing on the outside, what we think look like seeds is actually the fruit of the strawberry and the seed is inside. Am I right with that? Yeah, it's 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 oh, one of those like it's one of those botany or or like plant science facts that will kind of make your head explode. But <laughs> yes, that's right, Laura. So technically, although I don't know, you know, sometimes I'll hold that info because it's a little hard to understand. But technically, what we're seeing as the sort of um, sweet part that we eat is um, it's like a swollen. Um, uh, it's called an ovule. It's like the part of the, the plant that will make the seeds and it swells up and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But in this particular plant, the fruit is on the outside. So anything that has a seed of inside of it is a fruit, whether it's edible or not. And so, um, so the, the seeds that we think of are actually housed inside of tiny little fruits. And so right. every one of those black spots is its own little fruit with the seed inside that's living on the outside of a swollen ovule. Yes, that's it, a little more information than anybody probably needs because it's just easier to say it's a it's a fruit. Right. Yes, it's it's a little bit of trivia for you. If you're sitting it's around a little trivia for when you want to go and impress your friends and say, you know what? <laughs> These seeds so are actually little baby fruits. I have the um, strawberries cut up at this point, so hopefully you've had a chance to do that at home as well. And all I'm going to do is take a tablespoon and sprinkle some sugar over the top. So I have my white sugar. And I'm gonna kind of sprinkle it and then give it a stir. I'm gonna do two tablespoons based on the amount of strawberries that I have. So maybe you would say like one tablespoon per cup of strawberries. Um, and I think too, I mean, the, the sugar for sure helps to draw out the liquid, right? So that it actually makes the, um, the liquid that's inside the strawberry come out and it makes kind of like a nice sauce almost right. before you let it sit. But in terms of the amount of sugar, it also sort of depends on how sweet your strawberries are. If right. you have those delicious strawberries from the farm that are perfectly in season, you may do a little bit less sugar because they're already really sweet. Um, but sometimes when you get strawberries and they're a little, um, they have a little bit of like sourness to, to them, then you want to add just a little bit more sugar. So yeah. it's really to taste. All right. Let me taste one and see. Yeah. I was just going to say, do the hard work, taste it. It's good. It actually is sweet. You're right. These are very sweet berries. So they don't need a ton. I added a tablespoon of sugar per cup of berries, um, but I think it's okay to go a little sweeter because, as I said, the biscuits don't yeah. have sugar and in them. You, since you're doing this first, if you do the strawberries and they're really, really sweet, you also, since you're making your own whipped cream, you can also go a little bit lighter on the sugar on the whipped cream. Right. So that's what we're going to do next. So if you okay. have the strawberries... I'm going to head back inside. You, uh, we're okay. right here? Yes. See you soon. Okay. All right. Bye, Laura. See ya. All right, so um, if you've cut up your strawberries, you're gonna sprinkle some sugar on top, you know, do it, what they often say in a recipe in cooking is to taste. So that means like the way you like it. So if you like things a little bit sweeter, you might add some more sugar. If you like it a little less sweet, add a little less. And that's one of the things that's so great about making things yourself is you can customize it to just how you like it. So the strawberries are gonna sit and release some of their juice and their liquid and make like a, a sauce or a syrup that we're gonna put on top of the biscuits. And the last thing that we're gonna make is our whipped cream. All right, so for this, I'm gonna move over to the counter because I'm gonna be using an electric mixer. However, you don't need an electric mixer to be able to do this. You can do it in a jar. Um, so I'll show kind of both ways, but it's much quicker with a stand mixer if you have one. Now, for whipped cream, you only need three ingredients. Really, you could get away with just two. Heavy cream, or sometimes it says on the container, whipping cream, and sugar to sweeten it. Um, I'm also going to add vanilla, which adds a nice sort of flavor to the whipped cream, but you don't need it if you don't have it. Um, and then sometimes people get fancy and add in different flavors um, and make like a chocolate whipped cream or something like that. But today we're going to go with sort of a simple classic whipped cream. And one of the tricks to getting it to work quickly and really well is to make sure that your cream is cold. And... It, my mom always taught me to use a cold bowl as well. So I put the bowl that goes with this mixer in the freezer so it's gonna be really cold when I pour the cream inside. If you haven't done that, it will still turn into whipped cream 
no worries. Um, but that's a good tip to have just going forward. So let me grab my bowl and the cream and sugar and vanilla. Laura, I've added myself back in. I'm magically back in the yellow farmhouse. So helpful. Thank you. All right, so I was just explaining that it's, you know, it's pretty simple, just a couple ingredients. So I have my heavy whipping cream, and then I'm gonna grab some sugar. Um, we're gonna do a cup of whipped cream and two tablespoons of sugar. But as Jen was saying, you can kind of dial that back if your berries are really sweet or if you don't like things on the sweet side, um, you, could, you could do less. Uh, yeah, and I um, I just made uh, whipped cream last night, and it really is to taste, but you also can add um, cinnamon if you wanted to. Um, if you, um, one of the things that could be kind of neat, if you really want to get creative, you could steep your um, cream with like mint leaves. You could put mint leaves and let, let it sit for a little while in the refrigerator and then your whipped cream will have a minty flavor. Mm -hmm. So you can get really creative with whipped cream. A mint whipped cream would taste great with like chocolate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Chocolate wafers. That's a good idea. Um, chamomile would be a really neat thing to, to um, steep. And um, one of the chefs who works here at the farm was using honeysuckle and he was steeping cream with honeysuckle and then using that to make whipped cream. Okay, so the recipe calls for one cup of heavy cream. I think I'm actually gonna double it because I'm using the stand mixer. I wanna make sure there's enough in here to be able to, to whip it. So I'm gonna go ahead and do two cups of the heavy cream. Um, so I will add four tablespoons of sugar, but you can decide um, what you wanna do at home, how much you wanna end up with. Yeah, and and the and the nice thing is is that you can add a tablespoon. Like I might I might even Laura start with just like two or three tablespoons because right. four is a lot. Four is actually a quarter of a cup of sugar. Okay. Um, you may want to just go with like one or two, and then you just kind of mix it a little bit, and you just taste it. And if it's sweet enough, then you can kind of hold off and add more later. Okay, so that's good advice. So I did two, um, and. I'm gonna add the vanilla as well, just half a teaspoon of vanilla. So it's just a little yeah. bit of flavor. And I would say the other measuring option is a capful of vanilla. <laughs> yep. I always add a capful of vanilla to my whipped cream. And if you don't have a stand mixer at home and you wanna do this the old fashioned way, essentially all you're gonna do is pour some heavy cream, some sugar and vanilla if you have it, into a jar with a lid and you wanna make sure that you leave room so that there's room for the liquid to move around within the jar. Um, and you're gonna shake it. And you're gonna shake it and shake it some more. And then you might hand it off to somebody else who's in the kitchen with you and let them shake for a little while because your arms might get a little tired. Um, and you'll notice that after a few minutes, you know, depending on how fast you're shaking it, it takes a few minutes, you'll, it, you'll hear a difference. Um, so the outside of the jar will look all white from the cream but the sound will change. So instead of sounding liquid, like sloshing around, all of a sudden it will go kind of quiet because the um, cream has turned into whipped cream and it's gonna be sticking to the side of the jar and be more solid. So that is a simple low tech option, but I'm gonna use the stand mixer. It will be a little bit loud for just a minute, but it happens fairly quickly in the stand mixer. Um, so if you have one of these at home, you wanna lock it in place and I'm gonna start slow so it doesn't you know, slosh all over me um, and let it go for, Jen, what do you think in terms of how long it usually takes in the stand mixer? Uh, minutes, not, you know, like maybe one or two minutes. All right, so we're gonna let that go and I'll give you a chance at home to um, get your whipped cream going as well. All right, so I'm gonna start slow and then kind of turn it up so that it's, it gets frothy and it's starting to incorporate air, which is why you go from like a liquid to this foamy whipped cream texture. And the, the um, culinary term they'll say is that you whip it until it gets something called stiff peaks, which means when you pull up your um, when you pull up your whisk or whatever you're using to whisk and pull it out of the uh, cream, a little bit of the cream will kind of stay on it and turn into like a little bit of a peak. And Laura mentioned that you could use a jar for shaking, but you also could hand whip it with a whisk. I just find that to be really tiring um, and, and can be um, 
it can be tricky. It can take a long time. So that so doing it in the jar is my sort of second favorite option after having an electric mixer. And I actually used, um, which is not perfect, but last night I used an immersion blender for my whipped cream and um, that worked just fine. You have to kind of play around with it, but an immersion blender actually works also. Okay, yeah, I hadn't tried that. That's I love that tool and I use it a lot at home, but not for this. So and I actually to... have the attachment. I used to have an attachment for my immersion blender with a whisk and I don't anymore, but. Yeah, so I'm, I think I'm gonna let this go a little longer, but I wanted to just stop and show you um, after not even a minute, it turns into almost like Cool Whip, if you've ever had that. Um, it's not quite as firm or thick as I want it, um, but you can see it's starting to get what Jen was talking about in terms of these peaks. You know, if I kind of touch it, um, you can say it, it keeps its form. And mm, I'm testing the flavor. Two tablespoons is just right for me. So yeah. it's not very sweet, but it's the way I like it. So I'm not gonna add more sugar, but I am gonna let it go for like another, I don't know, 20 or 30 seconds. Um, I don't want to go too far because what will it turn into? Butter. All right, so give it just another 30 seconds or so. And when you make butter, um, you're just taking what Laura is doing here and um, you'll want to put like a towel around your um, mixer because what will happen is the whipped cream will turn into like really thick whipped cream, like almost like a buttercream or like something that you can spread and it gets really thick, really thick, and then it kind of falls apart and turns back into a liquid, which is strange, but what's happening is the fats are binding together. And then at that point, the fats sort of bind together and you get this clump of butter and the buttermilk. So, but when that happens, it starts to splatter. So you do right. want to have a towel. And, um, going all over your kitchen. Yeah. So, okay, so I'm gonna take this off. Um, you can see it's sticking to the, the whisk here because it's firmed up into that nice like whipped cream, soft um, foam or mousse texture. And I'm gonna store this in the fridge until we're ready to use it. Um, Cause it just stays better if it's cold. And we have just a few more minutes until the biscuits are ready. And so I thought I'd share with you some of our um, favorite books featuring strawberries. As Jen said, we're back at the farmhouse and so we have access to our library here. Um, and so we have a little bit of time to just share part of a story. Um, as I said, strawberries grow in this part of the world. They're what we call a native plant. Um, and so because of that, they have a lot of significance and are a really important plant to indigenous people, meaning people who have lived in this part of the world for a really long time. And so the story that I wanna share with you today um, actually comes from, I believe, the Cherokee people. Yes. Um, and this book is called The First Strawberries by Joseph Bruchak. And um, it tells the story of how strawberries came to be. And I'm not going to read the whole story to you today, but I encourage you to either find this book in the library or order a copy. Um, but essentially, the story of how strawberries came to be Oh, there's my timer. So I'm going to pull out my biscuits before I start reading it. I'm going to let them cool a little bit. Laura, what's the name of the author again? Joseph Bruchak. B-R-U-C-H-A-C. All right. So let me show you what these look like. Okay. So I just pulled them out. I, I did 15 minutes for mine because they were on the smaller side. Um, and they're a little bit browned on the bottom. They feel firm to the touch. So I'm gonna say that at 15 minutes, mine were ready and I'm gonna let them cool um, before putting the whipped cream on because then it will just sort of like melt when they're this hot. Um, but check yours, you may need another five minutes or so depending on the size. Okay, so Joseph Ruchak. Um, and he's capturing this story which has been told for probably thousands of years about how, these, how the strawberries came to be. So in the story, it begins with a husband and wife um, who live happily together until one day when they have an argument, which happens in all families. You know, even somebody that you love very much can make you mad. And that's what happens in this story. The husband says something and it makes the wife mad and she storms off and she says, I'm not going to live with you anymore. I'm leaving. And the husband tries to chase her, but she's too fast and he can't catch up. And so I'm going to start the story sort of halfway through um, 
where the sun is going to sun, meaning not the sun like the son or daughter, the sun like the sun in the sky is going to help the husband. The son watched as the husband followed her. The son saw how sorry the man was and took pity on him. Are you still angry with your wife? Asked the son. No, said the man. I was foolish to speak angry words, but I cannot catch her to tell her I'm sorry. Then I will help you, said the son. So he goes on. He sh the sun shone its light down on earth in front of the woman. Where its light shone, raspberries grew up. The berries were ripe and looked good to eat, but the woman paid no attention to them and continued walking. So she sees the raspberries, but doesn't stop to pick any. He tries again with blueberries and blackberries, but the, the wife doesn't stop. At last, the sun tried its hardest. It shone its light down in the grass, right in front of the woman's feet. Oh, I gotta go backwards here. <laughs> and strawberries appeared. They glowed like fire in the grass, and the woman had to stop when she saw them in front of her. They were so beautiful. Stopped her in her tracks. She knelt down and plucked one and bit into it. She had never tasted anything like it before. Its sweetness reminded her of how happy she and her husband had been together before they quarreled, which is another word for fight. I must gather some of this fruit for my husband, she said, and she began to pick the berries. She was still picking them when the man caught up to her. Forgive me for my hard words, he said to her, and she answered him by sharing the sweetness of the strawberries. And so it was that strawberries came into the world. To this day, when the Cherokee people eat strawberries, they are reminded to always be kind to each other, to remember that friendship and respect are as sweet as the taste of ripe red berries. So, um, a couple weeks ago, we did a class where we cooked with strawberries with our friend, Rachel Beth Syed, and she told us that um, sometimes strawberries are called the heartberry, um, both because of how they look, the shape of it, um, but also for this cultural significance that they're often given as a gift and as a way of showing love because they're so sweet and delicious. So I can tell you the kitchen smells wonderful. I'm gonna get a plate and we are gonna assemble our strawberry shortcake. So. I love that story and I, I love the idea too because when we cook for each other, I think we're often sort of sharing our love for one another. You know, when you cook for a friend or a family member um, or when you cook together, there's such love there. And I think it's only fitting that our first cooking lesson for the summer is this beautiful strawberry um, dish um, where the story of strawberries really does signify what we're, we're trying to do is sort of share this, this, you know, love for this farm and for cooking with one another uh, with all of you. Okay, so I have a biscuit. It's still warm, but that's okay. It's just not as hot as it was when it first came out of the oven. And then I took sort of a spoonful or a scoop of the strawberries with a little bit of that um, strawberry juice that you can see at the bottom of the bowl. And then um, what we sometimes call a dollop, it's a fun word, or like a, a heaping spoonful of whipped cream. And that looks pretty perfect. Um, so I'm going to enjoy this. I'm going to share it with uh, my friends here at the Yellow Farmhouse. And um, I hope that you enjoy it at home. And the last thing I wanted to do is to just recommend another great book that features strawberries that you can look for at your library or your favorite bookstore or even online. Um, this one we use a lot in our classes. It's called the Red Ripe Straw. Oh, the Little Mouse, the Red Ripe Strawberry, and the Big Hungry Bear. So that's a fun one um, if you are looking to read a story maybe this afternoon as it's getting a little bit rainy. You can enjoy some strawberry shortcake and read more about strawberries. That book is a favorite. It really is so funny because if you've ever read it, the bear character is kind of never shows up, but it's this really, you know, it, I, it, it, if there are kids out there that have read that story, I'd love to hear what your take is on it um, and whether you like it or not, because I know my kids absolutely love that story. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those books that we read over and over and over again. And Laura, that looks delicious. <laughs> it is. I don't want to toot my own horn, but it came out really well. 
It's not too sweet. Um, and it highlights the strawberries so well. They're juicy, they're sweet, and it's actually a really beautiful dish. So I hope you all had fun making this at home as well. We would love to see your pictures of your finished product if you send them to us at info at yellowfarmhouse.org. Jen, will put that up in the- Yep, um, I'll put that up right now. And if you send us your pictures, we can post them on our Instagram or our Facebook. We'd love to see your cooking um, and to hear how you liked the recipe. Thank you so much for tuning in um, for our class today. And we're going to be doing a class again at the same time next week, Tuesdays at 11. So we hope that you'll join us again next week. Sounds good. All nice right. job, Laura. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone.